All right, maybe I'll start my um, preambling. So welcome, everyone. Welcome to our September Cradle Research Seminar. Um, my name is Rola Jawi. I'm a professor of education research at Cradle. Um, it's my real pleasure to be chairing this sem seminar as the last stragglers trickle in. Um, we have a wonderful presenter today all the way from sunny Brisbane who claims to have brought the sunshine down. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I can tell you all of us in Melbourne are very happy about that. <laughs> so Dr. Um, Christy Noble is my friend and um, all the way from Brisbane, Dr. Christy Noble is joining us. She's going to be talking about developing learners' feedback literacy in and for the workplace. This is um, a program of research that Christy has been leading, looking at feedback literacy in clinical placements. Christy is clinical learning and assessment lead in the Academy of Medical Ed Education and the Medical School at the University of Queensland where she does research to look at the development of learners' capabilities and particularly interested uh, in workplace learning. Um, without further ado, welcome, Christy. Thank you. So thank you, Rolla, for the lovely welcome. It is so wonderful to be here amongst my feedback friends. Um, such a treat. So thank you for this opportunity to share with you our work thinking about how we can enhance learners' feedback literacy in the workplace. Before we begin, though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet and the custodianships of these lands. I pay my respects to the ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And I value and recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Now, nobody works on their own, and this has definitely been a team effort. I'm sharing with you some research team effort, and here's some of my stellar team members um, who have collaborated with me, with me on this journey. So in the spirit of reflexivity, I want to share a little bit about myself, and this should give you a flavour of the perspectives that I'm bringing to this research on enhancing feedback literacy. So I have a hospital pharmacy background, so I've had lots of experiences working in busy clinical settings, working with diverse teams from different specialties, so medicine and surgery, and also working as an educator in healthcare settings. So I really appreciate the challenges that can be experienced by our junior um, staff. I've also done a bit of research looking at how people learn in the workplace and in particular in clinical settings. So I'm threading that perspective through as well. The final thing I want to share is that when we, we conducted this feedback literacy work that I'll be sharing with you, I worked as a health research, sorry, as a researcher in a health care setting. So I was embedded within that context. And you'll see later that that's helped proven to be a really helpful um, position to be in. Now, as described by my friends Margaret and Liz, um, I'm going to share with you some intellectual candour along the way because we've got plenty of imperfections in our research um, and I want to be reflective as we go along to really help you think about the things that we've worked with and wrestled with and perhaps spark some ideas for yourself as well. So... In this session, I have three key messages. The first message is enhancing liter feedback literacy in the workplace holds promise. So when I talk about feedback literacy, I'm talking about when, when our learners have some more know-how or have know-how about feedback processes. And that really does hold promise for us. But in reality, when trying to operationalize this, we have had discovered some startling disconnects. And I'm going to describe our work today to try and illuminate some of these disconnects. So that's the three messages I'll be working through. Okay, so enhancing feedback literacy in the workplace holds promise. The reason I became so interested in feedback literacy was that our learners, so remembering I was embedded within a healthcare context, so healthcare students and medical interns 
were dissatisfied. They were claiming they weren't getting any feedback. So we had a teaching session, and this is a photo of such this type of teaching session, towards the end of the intern year. We asked our interns about their feedback experiences, and their response was, we haven't had any feedback all year. And I just found this astounding. And even as we probed further, at best they stated they got good job from their supervisors. And we'd been doing a bit of work with supervisors, so something was awry. At the same time, I started to read about learner-centered feedback processes and feedback literacy. And I just love the notion that we could be empowering our learners to engage in feedback and lift those feedback experiences. In other words, we could give them agency in the feedback process. So where did we start with our thinking about how to improve feedback? Our first port of call was using the work of um, Dave Bowd and Liz Malloy is Feedback Mark II. Now, what I'm sharing with you is also what we've been sharing with our participants. So I'm mindful of our export third audience, but I'm also think it's helpful to think about how you might share this with people in the workplace as well. So where did we start? We start by sharing a definition of feedback. I'm just going to give you a moment. Some of you will be, will be wholly familiar, but for others, maybe not so much. I'll give you a moment to read through this. So the things that we highlight is that feedback is a process. We also highlight to our learners that this is a process in which you get information about your work so that you can see what's similar to and what's different to what you're doing and the expected standards of the work. And that the intention is to generate improved work. So for us in the workplace, the very idea that this is called Feedback Mark II tells us and tells the people we're working with, it isn't just about receiving information. And this has been so powerful to share with learners in clinical settings and supervisors. So we show the definition and then we show the visual. So we work through and we color code it to say, here's what is expected of a supervisor, the yellow is what we're expecting the learners to do and so on. And then the darker purples, the two-way dance and so on. Our other conceptual foundation for our work is the feed, notion of feedback literacy. And again, when we're engaging with clinicians and students, I really like this definition from Naomi Winstone, which is talking about feedback as a know-how and how we're maximising the benefits of feedback processes. So this really resonates with the people that we're working with. So it's giving our learners know-how in order to make the most of feedback. Again, for our work in feedback literacy in clinical settings, the model by Carl S. and Bowles really held well for us in terms of ensuring that our learners are aware of and appreciative of feedback processes in the workplace that they're able to make judgments about the qualities of their work. Through the feedback process, they're managing their affect and then they're able to take action on that feedback information. So coming back to this idea that enhancing feedback literacy in the workplace holds promise, I'm going to take you through this study which we published in 2019. So just think, not long after the 2018 Carl S. and Bowd paper came out, we go on to this um, work about thinking about learners in the workplace and their feedback literacy. So it was a really beautiful timing for us that that um, paper came out. So what I'm going to do is take you through this paper. Um, and with this study, we aim to look at healthcare students' feedback literacy in the workplace. Now, this study was conducted in a large tertiary referral hospital. We worked with healthcare students to develop their feedback literacy and then explored, well, how do they engage with feedback in busy clinical settings? And this is photo of one of the institutions. So this is an interview study where we aim to really problematize and address student feedback literacy in healthcare workplaces from the learner's perspective. We aim to answer two research questions. How do feedback literate learners engage in workplace feedback? 
And then what influences their understandings of and engagement with feedback in the workplace? Again, thinking about the timing of our work, what we first needed to do was start to develop our learners' feedback literacy. And to do this, we invited our participants to get engage in a multimodal learning program, which I'll just talk through those elements now. The first part was, and this was before our students went on placement, we invited them to engage in an e-learning module. And again, we were sharing information about what is a learner-centered feedback process, we gave them readings about feedback, and I think we gave them articles on feedback. And we also had videos where students shared their experiences of feedback and how they enhance those experiences. The second thing we did was that then we invited these learners again before placement to engage in an interactive workshop. And again, we were reinforcing what constitutes uh, effective feedback and learner-centered feedback principles. We got them to discuss these ideas in, in, discuss, in small groups and large groups. And we also got them to role play feedback interactions. So where they played either the provider, the receiver, or someone observing them. And finally, we offered them an opportunity to engage in reflective activities, again, to reinforce these findings of what constitutes effective feedback processes, the feedback mark two, whilst on placement. So we asked them to complete surveys to, to really critique their feedback experiences. And this occurred during and after placement. So that's how we went about developing our learners' feedback literacy in the first instance. So at that juncture, we thought, right, we've got some feedback literate learners. Well, in fact, we have 105 feedback literate learners. And... Um, we did this work with allied health, nursing and medical students. These students then went on to their placements into different departments and into different teams. To address our research question, so how do feedback literate learners engage in feedback in clinical settings, we interviewed them after their placements. We were pretty lucky because we had 27 students happy enough to come back and be interviewed about their feedback experiences. So we had students from nursing, social work and medicine um, agree to interviews. So you can see the breakdown there. So what did we learn about feedback literate learners? Firstly, there are two key findings and I'll work through these in, uh, sequentially. The learners reconceptualise feedback. The second thing that we found was we learned about the ways in which they're engaging with feedback during their placements. So this was for us perhaps the most exciting finding. We were like, wow, learners were reconceptualizing how they thought about feedback. Our cohort of learners described their past experiences of feedback being ones where it was quite passive and they understood feedback as a telling. Now they shared that they understood really the key features of feedback and they understood that they had a role to play in that feedback process. So to give you a flavour of the um, data we, we got, I'll share this quote and again, I'll um, work through it with you. So I'll give you a moment to read this. So you can see even in the stance, it's shifting from passive to not just accepting or not being meek, but thinking about being active and then being mindful that they've received information. Okay, working with it, troubling around it, not quite understand what are some things that I can do, I can start to ask about it I, and, and thinking about ways in which they would, might do that. And then also thinking about, well, who else can help me in this scenario, finding someone to help me with that scenario. It was really powerful for us to think about that, that shift. Now, I've talked about how our learners were reconceptualizing feedback. Now, I'm going to talk about how they engage with feedback during their placements based on this understanding. Firstly, what we observed was that the learners were starting to appreciate the, feed, the processes of feedback, but particularly that it was learner centered, that it was something that they could drive. Essentially, they were putting themselves in the driver's seat of their feedback. They're seeking feedback, they're hunting it down, looking for subsequent tasks that they could work on. I'll share another quote with you to give you a sense of this. Okay. 
So proactive stance, hunting for it, knowing how to ask and getting on and, and then stepping out and trying it out and, and doing it. Also not adopting a scattergun approach, you know, thinking about I'm going to ask some people, but, you know, at least try and, and have a go and be purposeful with that. The other thing is recognising that if they don't do this, this is going to stay behind closed doors and it's really something that they need in order to work on and improve their, their work. You can really see yeah, this sense of empowerment that the students were experiencing as a result of this reconceptualization. The other thing that we observed through our data set was that simply understanding what constitutes an effective feedback process helps students be able to critique feedback interactions or supposed feedback interactions. So if someone says to them, you weren't very good, what they were telling us was, well, actually, I haven't received feedback in that moment. What I need is to understand how to improve. So you can see they're able to apply a lens of, hmm, okay, it's not good, but actually I need to work out how to improve. So that helped them temper their um, emotions. And another flavour along these lines, again, is this quote here. So I'll pause a moment and you get the pattern now. <laughs> okay. So you dealt with it, done and dusted on the spot. So it's taking action. That proactive stance allows you to do something about it, not just thinking about, oh, someone's told me it was terrible. It's actually, well, how can I take action? Um, and not mulling over things like I'm not going to work with someone again. Um, oops, sorry. Also being grown up. Okay, okay. Um, didn't do that right. I'm making sense of that. Now thinking about things and how can I move on? Um, again, this is really heartening for us to see this in our data set. The other part that got us really excited as well was consistent across the data set. So it's almost a logical story here, isn't it? It's that they saw a different way of seeing feedback. They were thinking about ways to take action. They were hunting, they were managing their emotion. So it sort of it threads along quite nicely that then they were finding ways to take action. And one story that really sticks on my mind that was across the data set was a nursing student working in the emergency department who talked about how she identified a particular procedure that she wanted to work on, urinary catheterization. She thought, right, I'm going to get feedback on that. She asked someone, got that feedback, then identified a subsequent opportunity and another shift, then identified a more complex procedure and threaded her learning across the shift that way. So she was increasing the complexity, but also increasing who different asking different people. So she'd asked nursing colleagues and then she started to ask the doctors, which she said would just be a, <laughs> which if we understand the hierarchy, that was very um, brave. Was brave. <laughs> um, so it was really exciting for us. Um, thinking, goodness, this is awesome. So there was lots and lots of promise, but I think what I wanted to think now is also it's not all sunshine and light, and and that's good because we've got further learnings to do. But there were some startling disconnects. And what I want to do now at the 20 minute juncture is invite you to think about what do you think some of the disconnects might be? Now I've got a Mentimeter there for everyone to have a go at. So if you could pop in some thoughts around what you think the um, disconnects, like choosing your own adventure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, at this juncture as well, if you have questions, you know, feel free to pop them in the chat as well and then we can attend to those. But I'll just give you a moment and I'm going to do a little tech manoeuvre and get you over to the word cloud. Lost your phone somewhere. And if you don't have your phone, you can do the www.mentimeter.com and use that code through there. Well, you can put lots of words. Oh, I can put lots of words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a limit there. I'm struggling. Yeah, oh. me too. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll back a little bit. <laughs> My bad. Yeah. Too, too many words. <laughs> oh, it's all right. I can, I can. Nope. 
Okay, and then I'm going to do the big reveal. I'll give it a moment. Okay. Okay. Oh, excellent. <laughs> Okay. We're not really coming to any consensus. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> There's lots of things that cause disconnects. Yes. <laughs> it's always good power. Power. Yeah. Quality. Power. Expectations. I think I'll, I'll pick up on the expectations. That's definitely something we should elaborate on. Um, hierarchy. Mm. Yeah. Lack of confidence. Mm. Power and balance, yeah. Lots of power as well. That's that's really not okay. Loads. It's also good good um opportunity for lots of further research as well. <laughs> <laughs> what we found in our work, which is why I picked up on the expectations, was the first disconnect that we noticed is that it can be really tricky for students to make judgments about the qualities of the work in clinical environments, whether it be what they've ta been taught in a higher education setting, looks different <coughs> in a clinical setting, <coughs> bless you, um, or from supervisor to supervisor, they have different expectations of what constitutes quality work. So for these learners, it can be really tricky to make that judgment about the quality of their work. So this quote from a medical student illustrates this point. And the key challenge was that I think is also as nascent practitioners, they need a lot of guidance on what constitutes a, a good performance alone, but then so as you add a complexity to that of the clinical environment, yeah. that's even more challenging for our, for our learners. So the second disconnect we noticed, which I think we can bundle up a lot of things, it was on that word cloud around hierarchy and power, but perhaps we did this with a, more, a blunter instrument in terms of navigating uh, different feedback contexts. So, this for us posed a key challenge in terms of what does feedback literacy look like in different contexts and then how do we best support our learners navigating these contexts. So again, this is a, another quote to give you a flavour and I'll pick up on the key points in a moment once you've read them. The quote. So why I put this quote in here around, certainly in the context of complex landscapes is it alerts to, to how the different placements are structured to shape the feedback opportunities. You can be getting lots of feedback information from different people, which makes that a complex landscape in itself. And you can be getting feedback from all different people from different grades. So, you know, very senior medical consultants, registrars, all giving you different feedback information makes that hard to determine where am I at um, and am I actually improving in my um, work. So it did alert us to a couple of things is that we might not be able to prime the learners for all of these complexities, but it certainly alerts us to the fact that we should be sharing with our learners the difficulties and challenges that they might experience navigating feedback um, environments in these different contexts. So I promised some candor. <laughs> um, so in terms of our work um, so far, we found that we had very limited engagement with our the reflective survey that we've invited the students to complete during the placements. So I think <coughs> that's something to be really mindful of. Um, whether that was because we were a health service inviting our students to do this work um, may have been one of the things, but I also think it's an opportunity to think about how can we, now that I'm in a higher education uh, role, how can we form those partnerships between higher education and industry partners to support the development of feedback literacy? 
it's a one-off. This was a one-off program. And I know Liz and I can see Carolyn here as well is doing some great work around embedding feedback literacy across a curriculum. So I think that's a really important thing to consider. Um, someone put on the chat around on the cloud around teacher feedback literacy. At the time, we were so excited about the notion of learner feedback literacy. We almost forgot about this, the teachers and the supervisors. So I think you've got to do the dance with both. Um, and for those with a health professions education bent, it was really interesting to know that there was that our participants didn't talk much about interprofessional engagement or feedback engagement, and not so much around feedback seeking from patients. The shiny picture I presented at the start, I think, maybe accounted for the fact that we had self-selecting students. These were students who were already feedback curious. So I think, well, you know, what might that look like for people who, who are resistant to engage in feedback or think about this? And we conducted the work in, in one setting. Now, I just want to throw in another framing into this and, and in particular thinking about how might we account for, for some of the disconnects. Um, and to do this, I just want to spend a minute or two talking about workplace learning um, and then why this might be of interest in terms of feedback literacy. So I've done work, a fair bit of work with Stephen Billett who talks about learning in the workplace as an interdependent process. So it's dependent on how a learner engages with the affordances of the workplace. So what I mean by this is a learner's engagement is dependent on what they know, can do and value. And so that helps us think about how can we prepare our learners to engage in feedback in the workplace. But at the same time, within each different workplace, there are unique sets of affordances. So activities and inter interactions that offer opportunities for feedback. And they will look different in different settings and in different specialties and so on. So that was one thing we hadn't wholly considered was what were the affordances for these students' feedback um, experiences? And I think that's a really important piece in the puzzle. puzzle. So overall for this work, what did we learn? Well, we think we'd enhance learners' um, readiness to engage in feedback. As I've already alluded to, we hadn't fully accounted for the workplace affordances <laughs> for engagement. And in particular, the different placements offer different feedback affordances. And there's a whole raft of great work which I've got there really problematizing and thinking about those con contextual considerations. Finally we needed to better understand how then to best support feedback literacy in the workplace. I think we'd started to, to take the first steps but there's much more work to do and I think even the word disparate word cloud highlights that there's a lot of work to be done. Okay. So our subsequent work, which I'll just share with you now, um, starts to illuminate some of these disconnects. So what I'll share with you now is the findings from our most recent paper, which starts to illuminate some of these disconnects. And the way I think we've started to hone in on this is that we explored one profession within one context and one uh, specialty. So we explored junior doctors in an emergency medicine department in a single hospital. Now, this work was generated in part, obviously, because we had a real interest in developing feedback literacy, but also at the time, and in this healthcare context, the junior doctors weren't happy. I've alluded to this already, but the junior doctors, particularly in emergency medicine, were not satisfied with their feedback processes. We also had a very supportive department, emergency department, who wanted to think about ways that we can enhance that. So we knew we could enhance feedback effects by developing feedback literacy, um, but we didn't know what feedback literacy looked like for interns, nor did we know how to best develop their feedback literacy. So with this study, we wanted to explore Firstly, well, how do interns engage with feedback in an emergency department? 
And then we wanted to develop their feedback literacy. So those two research questions speak to that, that aim. Now, we use design-based research, and I just want to spend a couple of minutes because um, I think it's a really great methodological approach to ex explore feedback literacy. I know there's some great work coming out of Cradle using this approach as well. The reason I think it's so helpful is that we can solve real-world problems that relate to learning. So, you know, we were working with an emergency medicine department that wanted to improve their feedback processes. But at the same time, we were able to start to contribute to these theoretical understandings and ideas around feedback literacy. So some of the feedback, uh, the features of this approach is that because, again, you can see it's such a tricky construct and I don't think we'll ever solve it with a silver bullet. Um, Design-based research allows us to work in continuous cycles. So we're designing, we're evaluating, and then we're redesigning. So we're working with the environment and the people in it to make sense of what's going on. It's taking place within the real-life setting. We were working with clinicians in an emergency medicine department, and this is where feedback took place. It took place on a big, busy emergency medicine floor. So we were thinking about and working with those people in that setting. We're also testing and refining theories, which is great, but we were able to start advancing feedback practices there and then in that emergency department. The other great feature of design-based research is it allows you to bring um, collaborators from, with different expertise together. So, Liz Malloy and I were working as feedback researchers. We worked with Jess Young, who was an embedded medical educator in that department. And we had clinicians who were educators as well, so Christian Crow and Vic Brazzle. And so we were able to interact and share ideas. So it was a great kaleidoscope of insight in, in that research too. The other thing is that with design-based research, the intention is to avoid solutionism, so not jumping to conclusions about how do we address this problem, okay? So it's really thinking about what is the nature of the problem and what are some strategies we can take to address that. So the research context, I've said a lot that it's an emergency to medicine department. Just want to, if you're concerned, this is not a real patient, this is a simulation, <laughs> but it's messy, right? It's a messy context, um, and I think that's a really important thing to be aware of. Now, this particular study took place at Gold Coast Health, which is the busiest emergency department in Australia, okay? There were two um, sites. I'm priming you with this contextual information because it's important. <laughs> um, two sites. They have a busy university hospital site, and then they also have a small uh, satellite hospital site as well. Now, it was a longitudinal study, again, picking up on those cycles. We conducted over 12 months, and there were five cycles, um, 10 to 12 weeks, which aligns to the intern rotation. So we, medical interns come in <coughs> to the emergency department for 10 to 12 weeks and out again. So each cycle included so we got the, the interns came in they did their usual work in the emergency department but just trying to have a go at seeking out feedback so it's the first two weeks a few weeks then we got the interns to come into a workshop where we again taught them about feedback literacy the feedback principles we had lots of discussions around feedback we got them to think about their feedback experiences so far, okay? So they're, they're, they're orientated to the context and then to reflect on those experiences. Then they went back and did their usual work, engaged in feedback and their work. And then we invited our interns back to, uh, for an interview to really unpack those feedback experiences and help us think about ways in which we can refine um, the program further. Now, uh, you'll all know with design-based research, or if you don't, one of the things is to think about the principles of the design of the study. So, again, we use the Carlos and Bard um, feedback literacy as components to think about our 
uh, program design. So again, it was about teaching the interns about what is the learner-centered feedback processes and then having had those time, that time in the emergency department, how might you address that? What might feedback look like in now that you've got a sense of the context? We also discuss strategies for taking action on feedback. So in, where are the moments to put your feedback information into action? Discussing strategies to seek clarity on the expected standards um, in that context. And then finally getting interns to share stories around uh, feedback that elicits strong emotions and then strategies to support that. Now, despite our foundational principles of, <laughs> you know, design-based research, we jumped in with solutionism in terms of our first workshop. We taught them all about feedback in a very kind of theoretical way. We really hadn't, we weren't taking account of context. So we're learning, no. <laughs> but uh, I think just be, just be really careful of that as well because sometimes you can jump in, well, Maybe it's a self-warning. <laughs> um, now, in terms of our research around this, after the workshop, we gathered these reflective evaluations. We also interviewed, had 21 interviews with interns, and we also collected our reflections. So what did we find? So I'll talk for that bit. In terms of our literacy findings, I'm going to take you through the findings in two ways. What did we learn about literacy programs? And then what did we learn about feedback literacy in emergency medicine? I've already, it's a spoiler alert, I should have said before, but we really did learn pretty quickly that you really need to think about when you're talking about feedback, you need to be able to relate it to the context. Unfortunately, we had some really great interns who were who are questioning us and saying, well, well this is what well, this isn't going to look good in the emergency in the emergency floor. So it really honed us to think about what would it look like in that particular environment. The second cycle then was really about not starting with theory. Let's talk about practicals. What what does feedback look like and what are ways that you can optimize or enhance these processes. So practical discussions. We also then realised we needed to think about, well, what other, and not stand behind challenges, but actually wrestle with feedback challenges that they're experiencing, how to adjust. Coming back to the idea of both student and teacher or learner feedback literacy, really, initially we hadn't engaged supervisors in our workshops. And if you think about medicine and hierarchy, it was really, really important that we had senior clinicians involved in, in those sessions as well. And finally, it's so important to think about not just what happens in those sessions, but what are the things that you're going to try out for size in those day-to-day -day session, day-to-day -day work. So priming them with challenges or opportunities to test themselves and up their feedback game, I guess. In terms of feedback literate um, interns, what we found is two key things is that we had again bolstered their um, agency and I'll unpack how they, how they were doing this. And importantly, we're really beginning to identify and unpack the contextual factors that were shaping their feedback engagement. So the three key ways that their agency was bolstered and I'll talk through each one in a moment. They were, they were initiating feedback conversations. They were working with others to make it forward-facing. Uh, forward they're also, again, um, sometimes they're better than us, but they were reminding us of the importance of both parties needing to understand the, what's going on with feedback. So here's what one of our um, interns was telling us. So here you can see that, and, and it, I find it kind of helpful to think about it when really they're priming they were they were flagging it before feedback mark two to say I'm on a shift with you at some point can we engage in a feedback conversation and simply and that was then in the consultants minds or the supervisors minds that this is a keen learner and I'm going to hold them to it okay 
the interns also described ways in which, so they were initiating feedback conversations, but they were also guiding the conversation. Um, they're guiding it to ways in which they could um, work out how they can improve their work. These are high-performing individuals who are always wanting to get better at what they're doing. Um, so I'll share with you the sort of sequence of the conversation, but also just to note, this takes a lot of work, so I think there's lots more research to be done. So in terms of a forward-facing conversation, the supervisor might say, good job, keep going. <laughs> but, you know, our intern literates, <laughs> our feedback literate interns would say, okay, well, what do I actually need to do to be working at a higher level? So we'd prime them. We'd give them some linguistic manoeuvres to try out. And then they go, well, get more experience. And so... <laughs> And that's then when the interns were like, well, I'm not really sure what to do now. So, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd stepped up, but then I was at a loss. So I think it's not super simple, um, but it takes work. But I think for us, it was heartening that they were trying these things out. And sometimes they'd have more success than others. So whilst their agency was bolstered and they were what the interns really were coming back to us saying, okay, you're doing all of this work with us, but really you should be doing the work as well with the supervisors so that it's not coming to them as a surprise that all of a sudden someone's asking for, for feedback, but they actually understand the blueprint for how we're talking about feedback. Um, and the other thing to rec that they were really mindful of was they, this was the busiest emergency department, as I said. So they were really mindful of, they have important, they don't want to interrupt all the time and think and disrupt that flow of work. So it's not just about asking for it. They're also recognising that importance of being mindful of the supervisors. Now, I said that we talked about interns all in one setting and we thought we'd sort of captured a nice little ecosystem for thinking about feedback literacy. But even though we focused on one, one profession and one department, there were lots of different contextual differences that were shaping the ways in which the, feed, uh, the interns are engaging with feedback. If so on a day shift, that feedback experience has looked really different to a night shift. If they're in a smaller campus, they found it easier for different reasons to engage in feedback compared, compared to the larger campus. Different supervisors at different levels offer different feedback information. So consultants might have more expert insights, whereas a registrar might offer more practical insights. And the other thing that we learned was around the fragmented nature of supervision. So these interns were often working with someone different every shift. So it's knowing about these structural factors that really shaped um, how they were engaging with feedback. So to summarise what we're learning about feedback literate interns, that they're having to read the cues of all of these different moments. So what's going on here? How do I need to adjust for feedback interactions? Maybe I shouldn't be proactive in this moment. Maybe I need to step back. Maybe I need to observe or maybe I need to be silent and wait for another time. So overall, what did we learn? We were learning that the feedback literacy is, is actually being developed not only through our workshops, but also through these act, different activities and interactions occurring in the workplace. So the stepping forward, the stepping back, all of these, might, we call them micro-social, I think other people have used this as well, but these different manoeuvres where they would learn something by that micro-interaction. Not everything can be taught. So I think the other thing, and to, coming back to our solutionism approach, really we need to be thinking about how is feedback literacy being developed through workplace context and can workplace learning help us um, elaborate on this further? Don't oversell the getting active. It's actually, um, and listen, I've done an editorial around this, but it's also just thinking about reading those cues and making that in itself is, is a fee for being feedback literate. The other exciting thing I think is that maybe we don't can we can enhance feedback <coughs> processes and literacy by thinking about work structures. So um, I did a session with this uh, <coughs> team of people last week and they were talking about well can we reshape our shifts so that we have more consistent supervision across shifts. Um, 
And that may then enhance both feedback engagement and also the literacy. Now, we started to unpick some of the, the feedback cultures within emergency medicine and Margaret's led some great work in that. There are different cultures in different um, so medical prof professions. So I think that's that's just medicine. Imagine across all of the different work workers um, out there. And just to wrap up, some refined feedback literacy principles. It's really important to have those targeted and timely learning programs. And our recommendation was that um, programs. You know, different departments in different hospitals might need to highlight um, that they how they do feedback around here. Importance of clinical clinician presence, really uncovering that context, and I think starting with working with the context and thinking about practical workplace challenges or ways in which we can encourage our learners. So, three key messages plus one. Um, Enhancing feedback literacy really does hold promise and it is still for us a super exciting construct. Um, we can think about the disconnects and we've started to illuminate those and I really think to start to further advance feedback literacy in the workplace, we really do need to appreciate and work with that context. And that's me. Thank you, Christy, for very interesting um presentation and, and actually just how much work and thought you've put into this program of work is, is very impressive. Um, I've got some questions online, so I'm going to start with those. So give yourself some time to think. Um, and as per usual, I didn't do this housekeeping at the beginning. I will formally wrap up at the hour, which will be in 10 minutes, but we'll stay on for another half an hour to keep the conversation going for those online and for those in the room. So. Um, first online question I've got, Christy, is how does design-based research differ from action research? Actually, it's funny I had this question last week. Um, for me, the fundamental part is that we you, you think about, so it's design, but it's design informed by theory um, that shapes how you do things. So for us, it was drawing on um, feedback literacy, learner-centered feedback processes. And as we've gone along, it's also thinking about workplace learning. Um, so that's a fundamental part is having that, that theory informing. And then I think to you start with design principles, but you also refine as you go along. So you come out with sort of clear principles at the end as well. Um, and you do, don't adopt a solutionism approach. <laughs> Leaving it open. Yeah. Um, any questions in the room? Phil? Thank you so much for coming here, Christy, oh. and, and talking to us. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. Um, my question is about transfer. Yes. So transfer in terms of taking your feedback literacy to a new context, mm -hmm. but also maybe if I can bundle in temporal transfer holding on to your feedback literacy for time and the interventions that we do actually making some difference a few years from now. Mm. I know you said you can't talk empirically on all of this exactly, but what's your what's your feeling about transfer and feedback literacy? In terms of an individual um, developing feedback literacy for a particular context and then yeah, go, going, going somewhere else. Going somewhere else. So Maybe a practical example, but what we found was that the interns who had done our engaged in our work in the emergency department then trying out some of those maneuvers in medicine, for example. So another specialty, they moved to the next specialty. Um, but then realizing that okay, the supervision structure looks different. I've got more consistent. So this is how. So I, I suppose it's honing them to. This is a thing that I can work on and attuning them to that, if that makes sense. Um, so knowing that you can do, it is a skill, I guess is what I'm saying. So that's for an important baseline. Okay, I know that it's a skill and I can work on it. Um, and then trying it out in the next. So I probably haven't answered that fully, but 
there is a bit there is a legacy but there is also then a, and a transfer and agency and knowing that you have agency in that but I think it's also important to um, to make them aware that different contexts will afford different opportunities yeah is that all right um, I've got a question from you, so online. How do you understand the difference between feedback literacy and agency in feedback? What are the similar similarities and differences? Oh. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> so I don't know. I feel like that could be quite a theory, theoretical discussion, which and and maybe to preface this, a lot of work, our work has been very practical in, in nature. Um, but I think it's also part of feedback being feedback, which I think is having that it's a conceptual knowing. <clears throat> but then I think I don't know. I don't think I'll probably be able to answer this in terms of I haven't dabbled enough, but that you can do something with it is perhaps what I would say, is that you can have capabilities, but then there's also influencing it and shaping. Um, taking action. And the taking agentic. action as well as, is, yeah, absolutely, it's being energetic. But I feel like knowing Uso's work is probably... <laughs> Well, Dave might have a view. Yes, please, Dave. <laughs> I'm going to buy that, that theoretical discussion. Um, what, what you've done is very impressive indeed, and it's taken the notion of uh, learner feedback literacy much further in terms of practice and equipping learners with, with whatever it needs to, yeah. to become feedback literate. Um, one of the things that strikes me is, yeah. as you describe that, you're, you're carving out more and more issues in yeah. feedback literacy that need to be addressed, yeah. like responding to context and being yeah. adaptable and all that kind of thing. But I'm just wondering whether viewing this through the lens of feedback literacy yeah. has a kind of limit, you know, that you can equip the mm -hmm. learner to do all sorts of wonderful things in a whole lot of different contexts, mm -hmm. but there are other things that get in the way yeah. of them learning. Yeah. And I'm just wondering what other uh, conceptual tools, other than the concept of feedback literacy, you might need in order to make a real difference to their learning in these complex situations, other than getting the consultants to behave. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean like emotional intelligence? No, no, I'm, I'm not. Reading, uh, reading yeah. the room. Yeah, yeah that, that, but that's all part of, of feedback literacy. Yeah. That, that's all about, all, all, this is all in the box. Yeah, but yeah. Feedback, the concept of feedback literacy is a highly individualistic exactly. thing in which yeah. it's embodied in the student. Yeah. So what other frames do we need other than this embodied skill that the, the learner goes through the world with? So I think it's, if we think, and perhaps talking about Stephen's work and how, how people learn, I think it's, it's also then what are the structures within organisations that can shape um, and support feedback processes um, which is why we've, I guess, because of why we've drawn on Stephen's work as well is, is thinking about, you know, how is, how is a particular workplace structured that will allow uh, learners to, um, to engage? Because I agree, it, it is an in, feedback literacy is an individual thing, but what's the debt? What's the um, opportunities and affordances within different workplaces. And I think thinking about those can be a really helpful way to, I guess, think about how, how that literacy can be developed. But, yeah, even as you talk, yeah, I don't think I fully have all. Is there anything else as, as I talk there that you're thinking about? Um. Yes, I mean, the, 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 one of the issues about workplaces is how little control exactly. anyone yeah. has over them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, we can identify affordances, yeah. but how do we change them? Yeah. So there's, there's, yeah. there's the issue about what, what's the... We've got a lever for change through feedback literacy, Yeah. but what's the lever for change beyond that? Yeah. So I guess some of the further work that we're doing 
is um, so we're working with a rural emergency medicine. So I'll just use an example about how we're thinking about this. And maybe it's about the con- supporting, it's about working with the entire team is what, what we've, we're doing. So previously we've just done most of the work with um, juniors, but now we're doing work with the, the consultants and so on as well to help them understand. And they're starting to think about things that they can do to support the feedback process. So that's one approach. That So it's actually thinking about the whole context and who the key players are and, and working with with them. This has been one approach um, as well, yeah. But you're right, <laughs> Keep it, it keeps unfolding. But I think it's a, conceptually it's good to think about how we might make sense of that, yeah. Thank um, you. I'm going to officially close session, but we are going to stay in the room and we've got plenty of really interesting questions, actually, both online and probably in your heads. So a quick plug for our next seminar, which will be September 28 online, and it's the next TEXA webinar in the series around artificial intelligence and assessment reform. So tune in to that 28th of September at 3 p.m. And just officially a big round of thank yous. Oh, thank you. And if you do need to leave, we do understand. But if you don't need to leave, Christy, I mean, I think this follows on kind of a little bit from the conversation you've been having. And it's a question about, do you think to what extent do existing workplace-based assessments like the mini CEX add to or detract from feedback literacy? And I love this question as is it what sort of an importance is it really for feedback literacy? Thank you, Damien Testimony. Yeah. <laughs> it's not actually Damien, but uh... uh it can be it can be a leveraging tool. Um it definitely, certainly for the learners and the work we're doing with our medical students is you've got this workplace-based assessment. This can be an opportunity to say you need feedback, so use it because it can be really hard to ask. So it's the university is making me do this assessment. So then that can be a really powerful tool. But it does come back to supervisor literacy as well, Um I don't know. I'm fun, and yeah, the trust and so on. There's there's a lot to, it. and I think maybe we refer defer to Damien Castanelli on. Oh, <laughs> Damien literally says, "Hard this is to hard to answer." To answer. <laughs> <laughs> How about the? I, I I really like this question from Erica. What about the feedback resistant learner? Those yeah. learners who discount the feedback received, did you find differences in participation in the study or less resistance after going through the process? Well, I guess I'll talk to even our existing work. Is It, it can be quite contagious. So if you bring everyone into the room and talk about feedback and so on, I think, and it, it does become almost a cultural change initiative that people start to talk about feedback and here's how we do feedback around here. So it has a ripple effect, I think, um, and maybe drawing on diffusion of innovation uh, as an example, you know, it, it eventually people, you won't catch everyone, but I think you'll, you'll catch people at the start and then it'll change. And the most exciting thing for us recently was that You know, we were talking about our Gold Coast work with the other site that we're doing in a rural setting, and we had a medical student from Gold Coast Health telling the interns at this rural setting, here's how they do feedback at Gold Coast, and I come to work thinking about what I want feedback on um, before I get And someone's taught me that. So there's a rippling effect. So I think maybe you won't catch them in the first round, but I think keep at it, yeah. Mm. Margaret, you had your and Liz oh, as well. Um, um, yeah. Yes, um, so many thoughts, and and I do think this question of changing the interaction between context is a key one. And something I was thinking about as you were speaking, which I hadn't thought about before, was how much of this was about permission, like how much yeah. your interventions just simply gave permission for people Absolutely. to do things in a context. Yeah. Yeah. And so 
there was something we were asking about transferability. I just was wondering, you know, without this explicit permission, mm -hmm. how do you think how do you think it will will go? How do you think people need to push up against that idea? The permission idea or Well, yeah, because you're in a workplace, you're saying in this workplace, we're saying that you can you can, you go can do that. People. Yeah. Yeah. Um I, and I guess I yeah, I was just wondering how located you thought that might be. I think it is located. And I think that's important because that then means you if you want to try it out somewhere else, you've got to think about who the key players are and who the influencers are. So we had the, you know, the head of department support and they were wanting to improve this. So it's you've got to work with the key key stakeholders as well um, to afford them that permission. Um, so as well as telling them, it's also knowing that this is we actually want people to be asking. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a question in the room? So you, you trained the students and you said that you had head of department buy-in. So thinking about the, the supervisors of the interns who didn't get training and you yeah. said very much that you would have liked that that yeah. had happened from the start, yeah. what was the awareness of supervisors that this was coming and what was their response to it? Did it go positively? Um, was there backlash to the students? Kind of was it supported? Yeah. How did that go? Yeah. So in our context, it's easier for supervisors to engage with a feedback literature than it's than not. So they actually really appreciated having someone come to them to say, can you give me feedback on DA rather than can you give me feedback? It, it made their job easier. Um, so they were, they appreciated, I guess it is, is what I'm saying. Was, was there any kind of training effect almost on the supervisors, training them how to give better feedback? Did you see that at all? Um, so in parallel, um, my what colleague Jess, yeah, one, but perhaps one of the things to share that I think is really neat that um, was sort of correct to the study but we're thinking about was that one of the activities that the supervisors were getting in a separate supervisor program was asking the interns for feedback on their feedback and the, so that would serve a double duty in that the supervisors were learning about their feedback but at the same time the interns were learning how challenging it is to give feedback so it was quite neat I thought to so, so everyone was starting to get on board as well, I think. I don't know if that's fully answered your question, but, yeah, yeah. You. but there's lots of creative ways to think about this, and I think that's what's quite exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just going to go online again. Um, how do you suggest learners capture feedback information for future reflection? Have you looked at apps for achieving this and what might, what might feed into it? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Um, we're, we're sort of problematizing this at the moment in the in the medical program at UQ. Personally, I think it's just helpful for them to keep their own. I know there are apps out there, and I know Naomi Winston's done some great work with feats and so on. But just encouraging them to keep a notebook and keep keep records themselves, I think it, it can be as simple as that. Um, yeah, but to, for again for our work. They're the ones that are carrying their feedback from shift to shift. So it is an important, I guess it's an important question because they are the ones owning it and moving from place to place. Kelly, you had a question. Oh, I think Liz had oh, Liz, been patient. Sorry, related to that. <laughs> Something that came up in a study that Margaret led around feedback cultures was about um, students reporting their feedback. Mm. They had their little green book on yeah. their black book. Um, and they, what fascinated me is they chose to file their feedback under the surgeon's name rather than ah, procedures. Yeah. Because, you know, how David Bowd likes not to yeah. right. Yes. Um, and yeah. so that's quite diagnostic as well about yeah. how people are orientated yeah. to them and they have these. So I think it would be a fascinating study, wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 So it was interesting that you chose uh, feedback mark two as the sort of yes. conceptual thing in I think there's a lot of fans of Feedback Mark 2 in the room. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
it's been a while since I've, I've read it in depth. Sorry to add David Liz, but um, my recollection is that it's still largely teachers designing the feedback processes, which are really great feedback processes that students do. Whereas in this context, it seems very much like students but learners are the designers of their mm. feedback processes mm. a bit mm. more. Mm. It, it sort of feels like there might be a need for a... Oh. Maybe. <laughs> I, I didn't want to utter the, the uh, phrase. Oh, but... Feedback might through. Oh, right. <laughs> where, 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 learners, where learners are the designers of their own feedback yeah. processes. Yeah. We have we have joked about this in our meetings. <laughs> we need a better name. No offense. <laughs> but I mean, what I need to riff off that is that the model, like people, I just show it, will show it to a room of consultants, or, or and they'll be like, "Oh yeah, okay, I get it." Like they, they can pick up the pieces that matter to them, and yeah, yeah. So maybe it's okay for now. <laughs> Joan, do you want to? Okay, I'm going to combine a few questions online because I feel like they're all kind of getting at the same underlying okay. idea. Um, and that's about, you know, within that training program or intervention or whatever mm. you want to call it, um, did you focus on particular aspects of feedback literacy and, and or do you think that there was a need to focus on particular aspects? So talked about um, mm, mm. shared uh, understanding, establishing understandings of, um, yeah. you know, how to make judgments about what information is correct or was it more about language, like which bits were most important? So I, we had our design blueprint as educators, but then as we went through those cycles, what we realised we just really need to talk about day-to-day -day, but then infuse um, feedback literacy concepts through or thread it through. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't being overt about feedback literacy so much. It was actually let's talk about your feedback experiences and what it might take to enhance enhance those. Um, so we just mostly talk about feedback mark two to see a template, but then how do you take action? Um, so Excellent. yeah. Fun. Stealth. 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 Feedback literacy via stealth, yes. That context is really important. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, tell us about your feedback interactions. Well, where are those moments? Okay, let's look at a moment. Oh, let's. how might you lift that or what, what might you do? Um, yeah. Mm. Thanks. So I should preface this with I really love that paper too. But... Um, so this is a striking example of how you develop, help develop students' feedback literacy by helping them build a conception of feedback. Mm -hmm. But I have a kind of a logical question. So through your research, so feed, the definition of feedback and the definition of feedback literacy are quite tightly bound mm. together. Mm. And through your research, you seem to be learning stuff about feedback literacy. Um, so that, that might suggest that that definition of feedback doesn't quite fit so neatly. So what happens when your feed, if, if your definition of feedback literacy changes or your conception of it changes, does your conception of feedback change? And in what sort of direction? So does it need to be kind of more fundamentally relational rather than individualistic or does it need to go beyond just understanding its quality and how far down the line you are to like what else might there be to know about work and processes and things like that? I think it comes, um, it, it probably comes back maybe to what Dave was, was saying that if I, I still think feedback literacy, I still think of it as an individual capacity capability. Um, and I still think that it, you know, feedback processes it looks like that two-way dance it is about improving and so on but I think what we're we're really thinking about well how does that come alive and how it in the workplace context so then what are the factors influencing that so I don't know that we've necessarily changed how we accept around the context of yeah I don't know I don't think we've changed anything yet on that Sorry, I don't 
Okay. Um, I'm being told yeah. there's cake outside. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> don't stand to <between> cake. <laughs> With that, what I might do is call the session to an official close. But for those oh. in the room, you're welcome to ask Christy more questions and online. Please feel free to email Christy. There's lots of things online, oh, Christy. Thank you. Everyone. So um, yeah. We're so happy to have you here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.